Hi, this is Dr. Toby, your host on Health and Wellness with Dr. Toby. Thank you for joining us. We have a special guest, Dr. John McFadden. Dr. John McFadden trained at the Mississippi State University, and he had his undergrad medical school at the University of Mississippi Medical School. Went on to get his pediatric residency at the University of Texas um, MB Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas. Since he finished that residency, he's been working as a missionary. Landed on the shores of Nigeria at the Iku Baptist Hospital, where he served as a medical missionary for 10 years in 1971. He remained there till 1981 and then retired, came back to the U.S., worked for a bit, and has since then worked as a missionary in Haiti and in Monrovia, Liberia. This man has written a lot of papers, has toured the nations, has been a blessing to generations, and he's been married to his wife for 60 years, and they have three lovely kids. You don't want to miss his story. Join us. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Hi, this is Dr. Toby, your host on Health and Wellness. Delighted to, join, to invite you to join us on our show today with Dr. John McFadden. You will not be disappointed. I mean, 83 years, his mind is still as sharp as a tack, and he's really giving us a few nuggets about medical missions and living the dream. I mean, he's been married for 60 years with his wife, went to Mississippi State University, went all the way to University of Mississippi Medical Center, did a residency in pediatrics at the University of Texas, and has worked as a missionary since 1971. Did a few years after residency as a private practice, but he's worked as a medical missionary in Nigeria, in Monrovia, Liberia, and in Haiti. And we're going to be hearing from him about different aspects of his life. Last week we were talking about, last show, we were talking about his experience in Africa. Tell us, did you have any... Um, we, we don't see it a lot in, in America, the Burkitt's lymphoma, you know, the tumor, the jaw of the tumor. They said it's related to, like, HPV. We, we did not see many cases okay. of that in Nigeria. Uh, seems as if the center of it is East Africa, okay. more there. But right. uh, I knew what it was and was looking for it. But oh, okay. I don't recall ever seeing a case. Yeah, they said it was in the malaria belt. How about sickle cell? in Nigeria? We saw a fair amount. Now, did you get any uh, training in America with sickle oh, cell Oh, yes, you yes. Okay. In pediatrics, you see lots of sickle cell. Okay. Now, one very interesting thing that the uh, Nigerians did, uh, in, in the 70s, uh, people had learned that you could go and get a test and find out whether you were a carrier of the sickle cell trait. And if two people were both carriers, they did not get married. We had a pastor friend who, who was wanting to marry a lady, and they went and took the test, That's and they right. decided against it to wow. keep a child from having sickle cell. Sickle cell. Yeah. Now, how did you get culturally and spiritually adapted and, I use the word, assimilated? I mean, 10 years is a long time. Now, like you said, you got used to the food, how about the culture? I'm sure there was a different way they did things. Sometimes, well, there there was, but it we had had more of a blend of American because in our situation, there were more Americans there. We uh, had we had American nurses who were mostly teaching in the nursing school uh, and helping in the hospital. We had a uh, an American uh, lab expert, had uh, two or three American doctors, and. Uh, and then the the main Nigerian doctor and his family were probably more American than they were Nigerian. Okay. Uh, they th he had trained in Canada, oh. and his wife was from Barbados. Wow. wow. <laughs> it was an international community, community but right. the there were some cultural things you needed to be aware of, and then of course there was the the uh, native. Uh, religions also that were quite different and were something one needed to be constantly aware of because 
many people went to the native doctor, uh, right. mainly because the Western medicine was so expensive and the native doctor was in almost every village. Uh, for instance, uh, one, one man in, in our town whose background education might have been fourth grade learned to do circumcisions. Well, he didn't keep his instruments quite as clean as he should have, and children began coming in with tetanus. tetanus. Uh -huh. So I started investigating. I went to the police even. They said, well, there's no law against it. Uh -huh. So to help the situation, I got him some instruments and showed him how to, how to keep them clean. I didn't have any more tetanus cases from him. <laughs> Just not to... And then, you know, in that part of the country, I don't know, my viewers may not know this, there are certain religious festivals that are what we call oh, fetish. yes. That they don't want you to come out on the day of that festival. Definitely. You know, they call it like the Ehigi Festival. And if anybody comes out, they could be killed because they came out on that Saturday or Sunday. Did you ever hear those stories? Yes, and I uh, had some experiences with them, too. Oh, wow. Uh, you, one, one time I, one time when I went back, uh, one of the nurses from the hospital was with me, a good friend, had watched him grow up. And uh, he and I went through this town that, that uh, had the festival going on, and these drunk guys stopped us on the highway, and the custom was you'd give them a, give them a little money or something. We neither one had a cent with us, and they were not happy. And uh, actually, one of the guys gave me a gave me a bruise on my arm. Really? So someone from his his uh, actually one of the leaders from his town came to clinic the next week. I said, Ah, oh, you're from uh, I can't remember the name of the place. It's up toward Agbar. And uh, I said, Man, you you need to train your people up there to be more gentle. So he went back and read the riot act to some guys. <laughs> But, yeah, uh, alcohol was a bit, ex was, you saw a lot of people with alcohol-induced uh, well, behavior we, in that part of the country. you know, there are alcoholics everywhere. Right. How they get it, how they do it, they do it. Uh, there we had palm wine, and uh, the longer it sat, the stronger it got. They'd have it in a, in a big old uh, Demijohn jug, and it'd be yeah. bubbling. Then they probably had some other, they called it illicit gin, and uh, one area down in the swamps was known for making illicit gin. Right. And uh, kite, kite. so, the, kite, yes, kite, right. uh, there, there were people who'd, who'd get this, and we had uh, our share of alcoholics just like everywhere wow. else. Wow. Wow. Sugar cane grew fairly well there. Mm. We had, as a matter of fact, I grew sugar cane. Oh, wow. My children loved to chew it. They loved to chew it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, um, looking back at the 10 years, and you, you, you had to leave, I guess, after your back, I guess, you felt you wanted to yes, get some and, proper help. Yes, and our children were getting older, okay. needing to go to high school. So, we came home when the oldest one was in the 10th grade. Okay. Did you, did you feel a sense of, I've finished my, I've accomplished what I went there to accomplish, or... I mean, when you left, did you feel... No, it, it was ongoing. Fulfilled, okay. Uh, it was ongoing, and, and we knew we had opportunity to continue support. Okay. Uh, we, we still have work going on in that area quite a bit. Right. Did you relate with other mission hospitals in the area? Like, I know there's a hospital in the Womosho, the Adventist Hospital. Sure. The, now, I visited the Adventist Hospital in... Uh, Ooh, no, no, down down toward uh, Oweri, somewhere around oh, Oweri. Oweri. Oh. Uh, uh, the 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 missionaries had had carried out how I don't know a grand piano, and uh, the lady was a real expert on playing the grand oh. piano. Uh, the the other mission hospitals were scattered around the country, but. Um, there weren't many. There, there was one in Joss run by the Sudan Interior Mission. Right. And then the Baptist at one time had five. We had one in River State at Joe and Krama. We had one in um, Ogbomashaw, one in Shaki, which is 
is in the, both in the west in the Yorba area, and then one at somewhere around Kaduna, oh. but I can't can't quite remember wow. the name. Wow. It was gone when when it it uh, got shut down during the war, oh, really? and uh, the main ones we had going when I was there were in Eku and uh, Agbomashaw oh, and Shaki. Oh. One story about Shaki in the area where they are, the people ate lots of pepper. I mean, excessive amounts of pepper. The doctor there did seven stomach surgeries in one day one time. And it was strictly from people taking in too much pepper. Wow. We, we rarely saw it in our area. <laughs> Different strokes, various folks, yeah. So tell us about Haiti and Liberia. So when you came back to the U.S., it was 1981, 1982. Yes. Did you go straight back into private practice? or? Yes, I, I went into, into practice, and then I continued to work off and on on trips back to Nigeria. And then later on, I did spend some time in Liberia as uh, working, really working with another couple who had gone there from Nigeria. I knew them in Nigeria, mm. and uh, they had sort of an independent mission we we it got in everything Equa. from growing rice to water wells it wasn't part of the equa church equa mm. was a denomination that has a hospital in liberia okay N no, no i i worked with them equa yes okay and uh, and knew the, knew the people well as a matter of fact i i covered for their doctor uh oh. one time when he was out of the country for a year right, right. um they still have a big work there in Liberia. Right? In Liberia, yeah. and, and they've uh, joined up with the uh, Samaritan's Purse, oh. and uh, have done more yeah. together. Yeah, that's where the Ebola, the young man who left, I think, North Carolina or something, but that's where he, Texas. He was actually in Texas. Yeah, so he was working in that hospital. That's interesting. So, what? So you you used to like go to these places like spend one month in the year, volunteer missions, really. You weren't sure. doing this with the Baptist Missions Board anymore. Not with the board, okay. but with the support of, of Baptist friends and churches, churches and okay. some others. Wow. Okay. But so mostly I've worked in Haiti since the earthquake of 2010. Oh. I went two or three weeks after the earthquake and with stayed who? five months. With who? I mean, which uh, organization? Uh, I went with with a mid mid missions. It's called Baptist Mid Missions. Uh -oh. Is a uh, Baptist organization mainly in the Midwest. Wow! And then I stayed and worked in a in a uh, another mission station that had a clinic up in the mountains, mm. and. Uh, and worked in several different, I even worked in the government hospital some. Uh, there was need all around, and I was able to help these oh other areas. Wow, wow. Yeah, I know it was really rough. I, and the, and my health, health ran me home. Okay. Uh, I, I developed something called tropical sprue, and I've yeah. been looking for another case ever since. But uh, I lost about 20 pounds and took them a month or two to diagnose me after I got home. Really? And finally, uh, you treat it with doxycycline. Took doxycycline daily for six months, and it, it cured up. But that was an interesting <laughs> experience. <laughs> like you were having loose watery still belly cramps? Well, a little bit right at first, but it was mainly that I felt somewhat tired and couldn't eat. I didn't, I didn't want to eat anything. Mm. And uh, I got back back into Monrovia to a uh, uh, an orphanage mission that I had had connections with. I'd stayed there several times before. And uh, they said, you're sick. <laughs> a nurse, uh, well, two, both of them there at the time were nurses. And so they, they put me to bed and brought me what little I would eat and got oh. me on the plane the next day. Oh. Uh, and then, then my Family, when I got off the plane, they didn't recognize me. <laughs> you looked totally. Different. I was pretty bad off, so 
uh, it was was an interesting experience. Wow, wow. I haven't seen a case of tropical sprue. I mean, it's in the textbooks. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you diagnose it by doing a biopsy or whatever. Yes, you do. Uh, you you do a duodenal biopsy. Okay. And that shows it up. And I still am thankful for the gastroenterologist who figured that out. I had no idea that I had such. I'd heard of it like you, right. but. Uh, and then I've been looking for, for another case, another case. <laughs> in, in Haiti when someone comes in that, that doesn't want to eat and very emaciated, you think of tropical sprue. It's supposed to be one of the, the, the centers of the world for mm. tropical sprue. And then I've uh, kept my ear open for missionaries who had some ongoing, ongoing intestinal problem, but haven't found another case. So was, was Haiti chaotic? Was Haiti dangerous was Haiti compared to Nigeria I mean because you went when things were really unstable well in Haiti. Haiti's uh, just about always been stably unstable mm. uh, it's kind of like Jackson Mississippi there are parts you don't go at night uh, the hospitals where I work you, you sort of you were known in the area and, and the local people do their best to, to try to keep an eye on things and, and help you as much as they can. Uh, now, Haiti, at, at the time of the earthquake, we, we had a president. Then they had a national election. And I've been there several times. I've spent over a year there since the 2010 earthquake. Oh. And uh, then they had an elected president then they had another elected president. He was assassinated, and that was probably a couple of years ago. Yeah. And things have have gotten worse, worse since then. Since then yeah. uh, uh, but but it's always been very poor, and the government just can't provide what what's needed to keep things in order. Did you go order. to Port-au-Prince, or where were you in Haiti? I've worked many different places oh, with wow. many different missions. Uh, Sometimes I would stay in Port-au-Prince and work with different missions that were connected with the orphanage. It's called New Life Children's Home. Oh, wow. And then recently I have worked with another mission that, that is out in the area where the last earthquake occurred, out on the peninsula. Mm. And uh, I was there year before last for two months after that. Wow, wow. All these missions, trips, did you have a mentor? Somebody who gave you instruction, direction? Did you have somebody who you could say pointed you in the right direction as well, a young doctor growing up? Uh, in, yes, in, in, uh, in growing up, you, you have contact with physicians. Mm -hmm. Then when you, you go into training, you have contact with physicians. For instance, at the, the university, we had uh, highly experienced professors who were happy to help any way they could. Then when, when uh, I was going to the mission field, even some of the missionaries came to our home to help us know what to take, to answer questions, whatever. And of course, when we got to the mission field in our situation, we, we were in a very supportive uh, site there with other uh, missionaries on, on site. So we had had lots of help along the way. Wow. Still do have help. And you still keep in touch with this missionary doctors, I'm sure. Sure, you sure. Still keep in touch with I'm, them. I'm in touch with people who've had ECHO connections, and they're scattered all over. One's in Congo, another one's in Uganda, oh, wow. uh, another one's in Memphis, another oh, wow. one is in Texas. So we have people who've been through ECHO oh, uh, still goodness. working here down yonder. Praise God. My goodness. And um, thank God they're all doing well. My God. Yes. Thank. So look at um, going back to your life as a missionary. Uh, when you grew up, and the call of God, was there any spiritual mentors that you want to give credit to, helped you spiritually, guide you spiritually? You said you grew up in the Baptist uh, Students Union or mm -hmm. missions. So were there places, people along the journey? I know you're 83, they've probably passed away, but did anybody inspire you as a young Christian or well, help you on your journey towards uh, missions? I would first say pastors. Mm. I, I was fortunate to have strong pastors all the way through 
college, medical school, whatever. And uh, the, the, actually the best missionary in our family has been my wife. Uh, my wife has done well. Uh, wow. she, she's done a great job with our children and many other people. Wow. How did you get clothes for them? Did, you, did she sew them or little things like that, you know? You can't buy clothes when you're in Nigeria. You know, little stuff like that. Their birthdays, you can't, I don't know, buy a cake. You know, little things yeah. that people take for granted in the mission field, you know. Well, the, the uh, first thing I think of is that she spent quite a bit of time preparing uh, a head mm -hmm. to take enough, uh, mostly what the children would need, clothing and so on. Right. And then we had people coming back and forth all the time. Uh -huh. If you needed something in specific, and as uh, far as education goes, uh, they have courses that are designed for people outside the United States that have United States teaching material. Right. And you can mail those back and forth. It takes a while in those days. That, right. But uh, that all, all worked out was very helpful. Now you go to Morrison Heights Baptist Church. Correct. Okay. How long have you been going? Over and, 10 years. Okay, wow. And um, are you a leader, elder, serve on the board? or? No, no. I've not. Okay. I've not uh, You're not a preaching elder or something? No, okay. no. Now, my wife has, uh, actually at our church, I'm known as Fonce's husband. Really? Uh, Fonce is my wife's name. Really? And she is into most everything. Wow. Uh, she even helps pack shoeboxes for Samaritan's Purse. Awesome. Wow. Uh, I, I support her. And then I have a very excellent Sunday school class that, nice. that I help with, and I'm interested in our various mission projects and awesome. I have and they they've helped support me yeah. on a number of mission projects. One of my nurses goes to um, Morrison Heights. Okay. Haley, I think, yeah. So she's awesome. Good. So I'm sure your wife might know her. So. I'm sure she does. <laughs> yeah. And um, do you have any ver verses of the Bible that have become like maybe your favorite or They've inspired you over the years. Any Bible verses that over the years have referenced your life or picked you up in dark times? Well, I have, I have numerous. Uh, the ones I, I promote are, are mainly those connected with the plan of salvation. Oh. Uh, and then I, I peep, you know, new acquaintances and so on, attempt to... Uh, point them to John 3.16 to get started. Awesome. A lot of doctors today are burnt out. They say 50% mm -hmm. or more doctors are burnt out. They burn out due to excess paperwork, insurance, denials, you know, lack of fulfillment in their career. And basically they become cynical and they're not in inspired or motivated. Did you ever face burnout as a missionary? in Nigeria or Haiti? Well, it, it got right old there. being not being able to function as, as was needed in Nigeria in particular. Uh, and then, of course, when you're sick, you, you don't uh, feel as if you're able to do what you need to be mm -hmm. doing. But in recent times, I, I have not really experienced burnout. I've been, been ready to go, and, and recently I've been working on uh, my pain research mm -hmm. and uh, have spent quite a bit of time on that. Wow. How did you pay for the bills? I mean, my viewers are wondering, I mean, this is an 83-year-old man who spent half of his life, maybe half of his life, in medical missions, but he still is able to support his family, take care of his needs. Did you have savings or did the military help? Or well, we have, a we, we, have a, we have a very good... Uh, we have savings, of course, and, and a very good uh, social security system here, too. Okay. That's, that's been great. Kicks in when you, when you need it. <laughs> well, and it, it helps to, to not uh, require a new car every year and this type thing, too. Did you, did you get your, your medical school paid for? Like, how did you pay for four years of UMC medical school in the 60s? Well, I, I worked. Oh, really? And uh, 
I, I didn't know anything when I came out. Now, we used some of my wife's salary after I got married the last year, but uh, I, I didn't spend much, uh, not much at all. What kind of work you, did you do? You could, you could, you know, eat eat in your room or apartment or whatever a lot. And uh, I did, uh, I worked mostly, well, I worked in an industry one summer, two summers, uh, one in, in West Point, Mississippi, and the other one for American Can Company in New Orleans. Oh, wow. Then I sold Bibles with a company called Southwestern Company, which some of the older people will know about, and uh, went to several parts of the United States to, to be located for the summer and did door-to-door uh, -door sales, and you could work wow. 60 or 70 hours a week if you wanted to. And I usually came out pretty well on that, so I, I uh, was able to come out pretty much debt free. And wow. I, I did this uh, up through up up through about the second year of medical school. And you've never been. I mean, you you sound like you've always been active. You've never been the kind of just put your feet up, couch potato, watch TV all day long. Well, I'm I'm sort of what's known as a workaholic. Oh, okay. Several of them around. I think you're one of them also. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, a lesson for this generation because a lot of people don't want to work anymore. They want to sit at home, that's get a check, and a watch TV all day. Yeah, that wasn't your generation. Not much. Most okay. of the people I grew up with worked. Oh. <laughs> Those who didn't work, I don't know what happened. They they went to they went to the social welfare office or something, but. Yeah, we believe in work. Even the Bible says, he that does not work should not eat. <laughs> and anybody who's been through medical school learned to work because yes. medical school teaches you <laughs> diligence, mm -hmm. discipline, dedication. You can't finish medical school without putting in the required hours of study. Definitely. You know, so what a privilege. We're going to come back one more show with Dr. John McFadden. I know he's been sharing a lot about himself. Last thing we're going to talk about is his... Um, the ministry, what God has called him to do, and then medicine, the area of medicine that he's been part of, which is medical missions. We're going to share a little bit about that as well. Look us up on www.faithandpower.online. Uh, we want to hear from you. Write to us at P.O. Box 550, West Monroe 71294. Looking forward to hearing from you. Don't forget, Jesus is Lord. God bless you.